This is Walter Bosley, and I'll be reading a selection from Alien Identities, Ancient Insights into Modern UFO Phenomena by Richard L. Thompson. Visits to Another World Here is a traditional Celtic story in which the abduction theme is combined with a visit to another world. The Seed King, Mananan MacLear, once got tired of his wife Fand, and she went to Ireland with her sister Liban, with the hope of marrying the hero Cuchulain. They took the form of two birds and rested on a lake in Ulster, where Cuchulain could see them while hunting. The hero tried to capture them but failed, and feeling depressed by this, he sat down by a menhir, a megalithic stone monument, and went to sleep. Then he saw two women dressed in green and crimson cloaks who alternately struck him with a whip-like object. After this, he took to his bed with a strange illness that no druid or doctor in Ireland could cure. For a year, Cuchulain lay sick without speaking to anyone. Then an unknown messenger came to him and sang a song promising to cure him of his malady if he would accept the invitation of the daughters of Aid Abrat to visit them in the other world. He returned to the place where he had taken sick and again saw the woman with the green cloak. She identified herself as Laban and asked him to go with her to the Plain of Delight to fight Labraid's enemies. She promised him that as a reward he would obtain Fand as his wife. In due course, he did this, overthrew Labraid's enemies, and remained in the other world with Fand for a month. Then he returned to Ireland and immediately got into trouble with his wife Emmer, who was exceedingly jealous of Fand. Emmer obtained from the Druids a drink that caused Cuchulain to forget all about the other world, and Manan and MacLear decided to take back Fand. Thus, Cuchulain's abduction into the realm of the Seed was relatively brief. The other world of the Celts has various names, such as Avalon, Tirnanog, and Plain of Delight. Examination of the stories makes it clear that this realm would have to exist in a higher dimension. To reach it, one must go to the right place in three-dimensional space, and then one must travel in a mystical fashion that we do not understand. We can speak of this as an extra dimension of travel in addition to the three we are familiar with. Since the other world can be reached by mystical travel from this world, we can speak of it as a parallel reality. This idea can be understood by imagining jumping back and forth between two parallel planes that are close together. The planes represent the parallel realities, and the jumping corresponds to the higher dimensional travel. Apart from introducing the idea of the Celtic other world, the story of Cuchulain has a number of features that show up in both contemporary and Vedic accounts. One is the idea of an amnesia-inducing drink. For example, Jenny Randalls described a case in England on June 19, 1978, and a case in the USSR in May of 1978, in which a salty drink was used to cause witnesses to forget what happened in a UFO encounter. She pointed out that several other UFO witnesses have described a similar drink, which seems to act as an amnesia-inducing agent. There are many accounts in the Vedic literature in which beings with mystic powers are able to project illusory animal forms similar to the bird forms of Fand and Liban. Although such stories seem completely mythological from the modern point of view, they have their parallels in UFO accounts. For example, Bud Hopkins gave several instances in which UFO entities apparently deceived witnesses by using illusory forms of birds or animals. Another Vedic parallel to the Kushalain story is provided by accounts of earthly heroes who are taken to the heavenly planets to engage in battles on behalf of the Divas. One such hero is Arhuna, Arjuna, whose travels to the realm of Indra were discussed in chapter 7. Another is an ancient king named Mukukunda, quoting, Begged by Indra and the other demigods to help protect them when they were terrorized by the demons, Mukukunda defended them for a long time. When the demigods obtained 
Kartikia, as their general. They told Mukakunda, O king, you may now give up your troublesome duty of guarding us. Abandoning an unopposed kingdom in the world of men, O valiant one, you neglected all your personal desires while engaged in protecting us. The children, queens, relatives, ministers, advisors, and subjects who were your contemporaries are no longer alive. They have all been swept away by time. End quote. Time dilation. This brings us to another theme common in both the Vedic and Celtic stories of mystical travel, the idea that time passes more slowly in the other world than it does in our world. The Celtic story of Ossian illustrates this. Ossian was enticed into Tyr Ninog by a beautiful seed princess. He married her and lived for three hundred of our years in her world. Finally, however, he felt an overpowering desire to return to Ireland and participate in the councils of the Fenian Brotherhood. He set out on the same white horse that had taken him to the other world, and his fairy wife warned him not to lay his foot on the level ground. On reaching Ireland, he searched for the Brotherhood, but found that all his old companions had passed away, and the country was quite changed. Only then did he realize how long he had been away. Unfortunately, at a certain point, some incident caused him to dismount, and on touching the earth, he immediately turned into a feeble, blind old man. In European folklore, there are many stories with similar elements, including the entry into another world and the aging or death of the protagonist when he realizes how much time has passed in our world during his absence. Here is a similar story dating back to the early 19th century. In the Vale of Neath in Wales, two farm workers named Rhys and Llewellyn were walking home one night. Reese was attracted by the sound of some mysterious music, but Llewellyn heard nothing. So Llewellyn continued home while Reese stayed back to dance to the tune he had heard. The next day, Reese didn't show up, and after a fruitless search, Llewellyn was jailed on the suspicion of murder. However, a man learned in fairy lore guessed what had happened. On his advice, a party of men accompanied Llewellyn to the spot where Reese was last seen. At this spot, Llewellyn could hear the music of harps, because his foot was touching a fairy ring. When each of the other members of the party put his foot on Llewellyn's, he could hear the music too, and could see many little people dancing in a circle. Reese was among them. When Llewellyn pulled him out of the circle, Reese declared that he had only been dancing for five minutes. He could not be convinced that so much time had passed, and he became depressed, fell ill, and soon died. If we turn to Chinese folklore, we find a parallel to the story of Ossian, with its time lapse of hundreds of years. There is a book entitled The Report Concerning the Cave Heavens and Lands of Happiness in Famous Mountains by Tu Quang Ting, who lived from 850 to 933 AD. This book lists 10 cave heavens and 36 small cave heavens that were supposed to exist beneath mountains in China. Here are the reported experiences of a man who entered a passageway leading to one of these cave heavens. Quoting, After walking ten miles, he suddenly found himself in a beautiful land with a clear blue sky, shining pinkish clouds, fragrant flowers, densely growing willows, towers the color of cinnabar, pavilions of red jade, and far-flung palaces. He was met by a group of lovely, seductive women who brought him to a house of jasper and played him beautiful music while he drank a ruby-red drink and a jade-colored juice. Just as he felt the urge to let himself be seduced, he remembered his family and returned to the passageway. Led by a strange light that danced before him, he walked back through the cave to the outer world, but when he reached his home village, he did not recognize anyone he saw, and when he arrived at his house, he met his own descendants of nine generations hence. They told him that one of their ancestors had disappeared into a cavern three hundred years before and had never been seen again. End quote. 
Here we find the same time dilation effect that repeatedly appears in European folklore. This effect, plus the fact that the man found himself in a land with a blue sky and pink clouds, indicates that the cave passageway led him to a parallel world. In the in the B Bhagav the Bhagavata Purana, there is a description of a parallel reality called Bilasvarga, or the subterranean heaven, which is clearly related to the Chinese story of the cave heavens. Bilasvarga is described as a very beautiful place with brilliantly decorated cities, lakes of clear water, and extensive parks and gardens. At the same time, the sun and the moon can be cannot be seen there, and the inhabitants have no sense of the passing of time. Belus Farga is subdivided into seven worlds called lokas, and thus it is more than a mere cave within the earth fixed up with artificial lighting. One of the lokas is Atala, which is said to be inhabited by three groups of women called Svarini, Kamini, and Pumskali. Here is what happens to a man who manages to visit this region. Quoting, If a man enters the planet of Atala, these women immediately capture him and induce him to drink an intoxicating beverage made with a drug known as Hataka. This intoxicant endows the man with great sexual prowess of which the women take advantage for enjoyment. A woman will enchant him with attractive glances, intimate words, smiles of love, and then embraces. In this way, she induces him to enjoy sex with her to her full satisfaction. Because of his increased sexual power, the man thinks himself stronger than 10,000 elephants and considers himself most perfect. Indeed, illusioned and intoxicated by false pride, he thinks himself God, ignoring impending death. End quote. It is significant that Atala is referred to as a planet in this translation. Sometimes the word loka is translated as planetary system, and the seven lokas of Bilasvarga are referred to as lower planetary systems. The Bhagavata Purana indicates that Bilasvarga extends throughout the plane of the solar system, and for this reason it is called a svarga or heaven. However, it can be reached by entering into the earth using higher dimensional modes of travel, and in this sense it is bila, or subterranean. In Vedic literature it is said that there is an hierarchy of planetary systems which we can think of as parallel worlds. The highest system is Brahmaloka, the world of Brahma, and it exhibits the most extreme degree of time dilation relative to the Earth. Other intermediate planetary systems exhibit intermediate degrees of time dilation. The time dilation in Brahmaloka is illustrated by the following story. The story begins with the mention of a submarine kingdom called Kusastali that may involve a parallel reality in its own right. The people in the story are members of the Suryavanisa, a dynasty descending from Surya, the presiding diva of the sun. They are considered to be human, but they were endowed with mystic powers not possessed by ordinary humans of today. One of them, a king named Kadumni, was able to travel to the world of Brahma, where he experienced Brahma's scale of time. Quoting, O Maharaja Pariksit, subduer of enemies, this Ravada constructed a kingdom known as Kusastali in the depths of the ocean. There he lived and ruled such tracts of land as Anarta. He had one hundred very nice sons, of whom the eldest was Kakudmi. Taking his own daughter, Ravati, Kakudmi went to Lord Brahma in Brahmaloka, which is transcendental to the three modes of material nature, and inquired about a husband for her. When Kakudmi arrived there, Lord Brahma was engaged in hearing musical performances by the Gandharvas and had not a moment to talk with him. Therefore, Kakudmi waited, and at the end of the musical performances he offered his obeisances to Lord Brahma and thus submitted 
his long-standing desire. After hearing his words, Lord Brahma, who was most powerful, laughed loudly and said to Kakudmi, O oh, king, all those whom you may have decided within the core of your heart to accept as your son-in-law have passed away in the course of time. Twenty-seven Katur Yugas have already passed. Those upon whom you may have decided are now gone, and so are their sons, grandsons, and other descendants. You cannot even hear about their names. End quote. In traditional Sanskrit texts, one Katar Yuga is 4,320,000 years. With this information, we can estimate the rate of time dilation on Brahmaloka. If the concert given by the Gandharvas took about one hour in Brahma's time scale, then that hour must correspond to 27 times 4,320,000 Earth years. It turns out that this estimate closely matches a time dilation calculation based on another story involving Brahma. This is the story of the Brahma Vimohana Lila, or the bewilderment of Brahma by Krishna. Several thousand years ago, Krishna descended to the earth as an avatar and was playing as a young cowherd boy, tending calves in the forests of Vrindavana which is to the south of present-day New Delhi. To test Krishna's potency, Brahma used his mystic power to steal Krishna's calves and cowherd boyfriends and hide them in suspended animation in a secluded place. He then went away for a year of earthly time to see what would happen. Krishna responded to Brahma's trick by expanding himself into identical copies of the calves and the boys. When Brahma returned to see what had happened, he saw that Krishna was playing with the boys and calves just as before, and he became completely bewildered. On checking the boys and calves that he had hidden away, he found that they were indistinguishable from the ones playing with Krishna, and he couldn't understand how this was possible. Finally, Krishna revealed to Brahma that these latter boys and calves were actually identical with himself, and he allowed Brahma to have a direct vision of the spiritual world. Now it turns out that even though Brahma was absent for one earth year, on his time scale only a moment had passed. The Sanskrit word used here for a moment of time is truti. There are various definitions of a truti, but the Vedic astronomy text called the Surya Siddhanta defines a truti to be one thirty-three thousand seven hundred and fiftieth seconds. This tells us that one year on Earth corresponds to one thirty-three thousand seven hundred and fiftieth seconds in the time of Brahma. As I pointed out, King Kakudmi's visit to Brahmaloka took twenty-seven times four million three hundred and twenty thousand Earth years. If we multiply this by the fraction one over thirty-three thousand seven fifty, we find that in Brahma's time, King Kakudmi's visit lasted. 3,456 seconds, or just under an hour. This is consistent with the story that the king had to wait for a musical performance to finish before having a brief conversation with Lord Brahma. By the way, after Brahma had his meeting with Krishna, he brought the original cowherd boys back to normal consciousness. They found to their amazement that they had one year of missing time. Parallel Realms and UFOs There are contemporary reports of experiences in which a person seemingly enters briefly into another world and then returns to our ordinary world to find that much time has passed. Like the story of Reese and Llewellyn, these stories typically arise in the context of traditional belief systems involving beings with mystical powers. For example, in June 1982 in Malaysia, a 12-year-old girl named Maswati Pilas was going to the river at 10 a.m. to wash some clothes. Suddenly, she encountered a strange female being of her own size who invited her to see another land. She felt no fear and found herself in a bright and beautiful place. It seemed as if time had whizzed by. She was discovered two days later lying on the ground unconscious by relatives who had been frantically searching that very area 
for two days. In Malaysia, these beings are called bunyans, and they are said to often abduct children. UFOs are not associated with them, however. And Jenny Randalls reported that a search for UFO abduction cases in Malaysia turned up nothing. In summary, the story of Ossian is typical of Celtic fairy lore in that it takes place in a parallel reality, and it involves a time dilation effect in which time passes more slowly in the parallel world than in the ordinary world. We see the same thing in the Chinese cave story and in the many Vedic accounts. The story of Rhys and Llewellyn and the story of Maswati Pilas both involve a parallel reality that seems to be directly connected to our familiar world, and there is a moderate time dilation effect. As far as I am aware, in UFO accounts, there are no direct parallels to the stories of Ossian, Rhys and Llewellyn, and Maswati Pilas, in which there is explicit entry into a parallel world. People in UFO encounters are sometimes shifted to a state in which they can pass through walls. There are also stories in which people are taken on UFOs to very strange and familiar places, such as the subterranean realm described by Betty Andreessen. However, it is hard to say whether these places are on this earth, on another planet, or in another dimension. Even out-of-body experiences on UFOs could be taking place in ordinary three-dimensional space, since OBEs in which a cardiac patient views his own unconscious body plainly do take place in ordinary hospital rooms. Since Betty Andreessen spoke of going through a closed door of her house and then through a normal open door in the UFO parked outside, one can argue that perhaps the UFO itself existed in another dimension. In that case, the same thing might be said about the subterranean realm she subsequently visited. Of course, it is also possible that Betty resumed a normal physical state after passing through the door and entered a UFO made of ordinary matter in ordinary three-dimensional space. Perhaps the strongest argument linking UFO reports with accounts of parallel realities is that both involve beings with similar mystic powers and similar modes of behavior. If certain beings can operate in a parallel world and other similar beings pass through walls and operate flying machines that seem to violate the laws of physics, then perhaps the flying machines can also cross into parallel worlds. Perhaps they also er originate in such worlds. Once this step is taken, an additional argument can be made as follows. The total number of reported authenticated UFO encounters is very large, and the total number of encounters actually occurring must be much larger. It would seem that these operations must impose a great burden on the UFO entities if they have to commute regularly to the Earth from another planet by ordinary three-dimensional travel limited by the speed of light. But... If they live in a parallel reality, then they do not have to travel very far to reach us. Of course, one could argue that they might travel from other stars in a quick, convenient way that avoids the limitation of the speed of light. But this would make other star systems, in effect, parallel worlds that are directly connected to our own world. The Vedic idea of the subterranean heavenly planets is perhaps similar to this. These are planets, and they are in the heavens but they can also be quickly reached by entering into the earth. The Rarity of Flying Machines in Fairy Traditions In Chapter 7, I pointed out that there are many references to flying machines called vimanas in the Vedic literature. Many vimanas closely resemble UFOs, and their humanoid pilots have powers similar to those attributed to UFO entities. There are also substantial parallels between accounts of humanoid beings in Vedic literature and corresponding accounts in European folklore, but in European folklore there are relatively few descriptions of remarkable flying machines. Why don't flying machines tend to show up in the European material? The available data suggests that this might involve a cultural phenomenon. We know that some human cultures use airplanes and others, even today, do not. Similarly, some groups of humanoid beings may make use of flying machines and others may not. The latter may include the mystical interdimensional beings mentioned in the surviving European folklore. Similar beings mentioned in Vedic literature, such as the Nagas, also seem to have done without flying machines. At the same time, other beings, such as the Divas, Gandharvas, and Danavas, made extensive use of different kinds of Vimanas. 
In his book Dimensions on UFOs and European folklore, Jacques Vallée said that the modern belief in flying saucers is identical with the earlier belief in the so-called good people. To back this up, he gave many examples showing parallels between the behavior and powers of those good people on the one hand and UFO entities on the other. But he gave few examples in which the good people appear to have used aerial vehicles. One example he did give was taken from the book Entretiens sur la Sciences Secrets, which was written in 9th century France. It tells of four people who were abducted and carried away on aerial ships. Quoting, One day, among other instances, it chanced at Lyon that three men and a woman were seen descending from these aerial ships. The entire city gathered about them, crying out that they were magicians and were sent by Grimaldus, Duke of Beneventum, Charlemagne's enemy, to destroy the French harvests. In vain the four innocents sought to vindicate themselves by saying that they were their own country folk and had been carried away a short time since by miraculous men who had been sh who had shown them unheard of marvels and had desired to give them an account of what they had seen. The frenzied populace were on the point of casting them into the fire when the worthy Agabard, Bishop of Lyon, having heard the accusations of the people and the defense of the accused, gravely pronounced that both one and the other were false. End quote. The story refers to the miraculous men as sylphs, a class of beings thought by Paracelsus to inhabit the Earth's atmosphere and to have the power of appearing or disappearing at will before humans. Later on in his book, Valet said, I have not yet drawn from popular folklore the stories that support most directly the idea that strange flying objects have been seen throughout history in connection with the little people. But let us clear up this point now. Yet in what followed, Valet unfortunately gave no examples of UFO-like objects connected with traditional fairy lore. His closest approximation to an example was a so-called chariot with, chariot with whining wheels, which sped up a hill and with marvelous, marvelous velocity, being pulled by traditional hairy dwarfs of a kind known as farfadets. This was seen one night in the 1850s by a group of women near the Ygre River in France. The women testified that the strange chariot leaped up over the vineyard and was lost in the night. Valet seemed to regard the chariot as a typical UFO. However, the marvelous thing here is not the chariot, but the beings pulling it. Even if the chariot had remarkable properties such as weightlessness, it was still described as a wheeled vehicle that moves by being pulled. This hardly fits the description of typical UFOs. Valet also cited Evans Wentz on an aerial battle of the good people that was observed during the Irish Potato Famine in 1846-47. The witness of this battle said, I saw the good people and hundreds besides me saw them fighting in the sky over Nakma and on towards Galway. But it would not be justifiable to infer that the good people were fighting in UFOs. Surely the witness was speaking of beings in human form who seemed to directly move through the air and fight with each other. The above-mentioned sylphs of 9th century France were also said to march in the air in armies. According to the story, these beings were seen in the air in human forms, sometimes in battle array, marching in good order, halting under arms, or encamped beneath magnificent tents, sometimes on wonderfully constructed aerial ships, whose flying squadrons roved at the will of the Zephyrs. In fact, there are many stories of armies seen in the sky. Three possible explanations of this are, one, the aerial armies are illusions created by natural mirage effects, two, they are illusions generated by mystical power, and three, they are made up of beings using powers of levitation to actually fight within the atmosphere. Explanation one might be adequate if the aerial armies looked rather vague, then it might be that human imagination was converting some natural mirage effect into an illusory vision of armies in the sky. 
On the other hand, Explanation 2 might be called for if the armies were clearly visible. It is significant that remarkable mirages are known by the name of Feta Morgana, which is the Latin form of Morgan le Fay, the name of King Arthur's fairy sister. Thus, there are remarkable natural mirages that look like cities or armies in the sky, and there is also a tradition indicating that the seed can project remarkable aerial illusions. William Corliss has collected many examples of unusual mirages and atmospheric effects. Here is an example of an illusory army seen at ground level in Westphalia, Germany in 1854. Quoting, On the 22nd of last month, a surprising prodigy of nature was seen by many persons in Budrich, a village between Una and Verl. Shortly before sunset, an army of boundless extent and consisting of infantry and cavalry and an enormous number of wagons was observed to proceed across the country in marching order. So distinctly seen were all these appearances that even the flashing of the firelocks and the color of the cavalry uniform, which was white, could be distinguished. The whole array advanced in the direction of the wood of Schaffhauser, and as the infantry entered the thicket and the cavalry drew near, they were hid all at once with the trees in a thick smoke. Two houses also in flames were seen with the same distinctness. At sunset the whole phenomenon vanished. As respects the fact, the government has taken the evidence of fifty eyewitnesses who have deposed to a universal agreement respecting this most remarkable appearance." End quote. Note that the army was seen to be equipped with weapons typical of the 1850s. As far as Vedic literature is concerned, it is understood that a variety of different types of humanoid beings are capable of projecting an astonishing, uh, astonishing illusions that can affect large numbers of people at once. One name for such illusions is Gandharva Pura, which means City of the Gandharvas, and refers to an image of a floating city. At the same time, the Vedic literature also describes actual flying cities and battles in which the combatants maneuver in mid-air using powers of levitation. An example would be the battle between Arjuna and the soldiers of Hiranyapura, mentioned in Chapter 7. Of course, such battles would probably not be fought with weapons resembling those of contemporary human society. The conclusion is that aerial armies are quite different from the vehicles seen in typical UFO encounters and they are generally illusions. At the same time, some UFO reports may involve elaborate illusion. An example would be the illusory helicopters with meshing rotors reported by the journalist Ed Conroy. Another example is the story in which Bud Hopkins witness Kathy Davis was lured at night to what looked like a 7-Eleven food store but which turned out to be a parked UFO. It is possible that the illusory armies and the UFO projected illusions may make use of similar technology, and they may even be produced by beings of the same kind. In his section on UFOs and folklore, Valet went on to mention a 1790 sighting near Alencon, France, of a fiery sphere that moved with great velocity made a whistling sound, and then landed and set fire to plants. A man emerged from a door in the sphere, dressed in a tight-fitting suit. He spoke some incomprehensible words to the gathering crowd of onlookers and fled into the woods. Then the sphere silently exploded and burned. Here we have an early account of what seems like some kind of UFO crash, but there is no reason to connect it with traditional fairy lore. Valet also gave some interesting references to stories in non-European traditions that resemble UFO accounts. For example, the Paiute Indians say that California was once populated by a group called the Hav Masus, who were highly civilized. These people used flying canoes, as they were called, which were silvery and had wings. They flew in the manner of eagles and made a whirring noise. They were also using a very strange weapon a small tube that could be held in one hand and would stun their enemies, producing lasting paralysis and a feeling similar to a shower of cactus needles. Such stunning tubes often turn up in UFO accounts. All in all, in the folklore surveyed by Valet, 
There are some references to flying machines resembling contemporary UFOs, but these are quite rare. This seems to be particularly true of the Celtic folklore. However, the humanoid beings described in European folklore do exhibit many traits typical of the humanoids associated with UFOs. This is Walter Bosley, and I've just read a selection from Alien Identities by Richard L. Thompson. <laughs>